struggle against colonialism and to establish newly independent states under the banner of socialism. The people of the Gokos were not ruling themselves. They had representatives of the Queen of England ruling through her governor. I mean, that was direct colonial rule. I mean, there was no significant infrastructure. The only infrastructure that was here was, of course, roads from the mines, you know, to the port. Nkrumah returned to the Gold Coast in 1947 as a result of an invitation by the United Gold Coast Convention, otherwise known as the UGCC, to take up the appointment as secretary for this new organization. Which he's been noted as a, a young, clever young man. And he's invited back to be the gopher for the United Gold Coast Convention, which in many senses is the first political party in, in Ghana. He was quite suspicious of the leadership of the United Gold Coast Convention because this leadership was made up of um, representatives of the privileged classes and Nkrumah doubted their commitment to what he would consider to be independent. He found them amateurish. He compared with what he'd seen in terms of political organization in London. He found them uh, undirected, that they were part-time politicians. They were more interested in making money uh, than in politics. Uh, they had personal reasons for being political. Well, here again, it's, it's important to recognize that the colonialists had deliberately created an African class who believed in the ideology and believed in the colonial enterprise. This African elite class was interested in ending colonialism, but ending colonialism only to the extent that they assumed the power of the colonialists and continued to maintain the colonial structures. He builds a party within the party of trusted people uh, who have a, links with all the other units of disaffection in, in, in the Gold Coast, the so-called voluntary associations, and these are all sorts of scholars unions, market women's associations, and he builds links with them, and that's very brilliantly done. As Nkrumah was talking about uh, independence now, the opposing forces were saying, no, we don't need that now. We should struggle for independence at some, at, at some future date. The youth and the grassroots identified with Nkrumah was the privileged classes were trying to just hold them back and also trying to get Nkrumah to, to tone down. He then challenges the involvement of United Gold Coast Convention politicians with the Commission of Inquiry into the riots of, of uh, February 1948, the Watson Commission, and the, particularly their involvement in the, the, the Kusi Committee that drafts the new constitution. Their involvement in that is a death knell for them. They're involved with the colonial state in making another colonial constitution. And he denounces them, and he's in a perfect position to do that. He does it very, very cleverly. The pressure from the youth and the grassroots was said that in 1949, Nkrumah broke away from the United Gold Coast Convention and set up the Convention People's Party. On June 12, 1949, he formally launched the Convention People's Party at West End Arena, Accra here. And the party was formed and was born. And all of us registered as men. And right away, of course, there was, uh, there was antagonism on the side of the UGCC, lining themselves with Europe, while Kwame Nkrumah was aligning himself with the masses of the people in Ghana. The Convention People's Party, or CPP, was created as a vehicle to bring emancipation to the local people of the Gold Coast at that time. No oppressor abandons oppression as a gift to the oppressed. I have not heard of it anywhere in the world. Colonialism is not a tea party. Colonialism is tough. Colonialism is wicked. And colonialism is oppression. And so when you want to get yourself out of this, it's a struggle. You can't get out of it just by passing resolutions and smiling, making good speeches. You have to fight. And you have to remove the oppressor. And if you don't fight to remove the oppressor, the oppressor will even recruit people internally and they'll continue acting on behalf of the oppressor throughout. The campaign for positive action that Nkrumah's Convention People's Party pursued um, was a strategy very much 
influenced by Gandhian philosophy and principles. It was a strategy of non-violence and civil disobedience. While Nkrumah was calling for positive action, you know, the strikes, uh, the demonstrations and stuff, the other people were calling him a troublemaker and a rabble-rouser. Which then gives the colonial state the excuse for banging up lots of people for inciting an illegal strike. He's banged up. And of course, it's absolutely perfect that he's banged up as, a, as his first period of martyrdom. Nkrumah spent 14 months in James Fort Prison in Accra. And he plays this to the limit, and he knows enough about Gandhi and, and so on to know this is a clever, a clever and a useful th thing to do. Meanwhile, the work of the party, which has already been put in train as a, a well-oiled machine, is going on outside. He wrote letters that he wrote on toilet paper that were smuggled out of the prison and carried to his right-hand lieutenant, Komla Gebedema. The legislation at that time did not prevent him from contesting as a parliamentary candidate. And it became clear at a point in time when the colonial government agreed that constitutional rule for Ghana was going to begin, but Nkrumah was also going to stand. And it then comes to the first general election that Ghana has ever had in, in 1951, which is contested by his political party, the Convention of People's Party, although he's still in the nick. He stands for across Central and overwhelmingly wins the seat. England was forced to allow there to be a referendum of independence of staying with colonial rule, in, and the CPP won landslide victory. And under that pressure, he's released by, by, by the governor. And because the Convention People's Party won more seats than anybody else, they're asked to, fight, to form the first African government in the Gold Coast, along with colonial officials. The election was met with enthusiasm and excitement everywhere, everywhere in the African world. I mean, Ghana had become now the black star of the world. I mean, everybody looked to Ghana. The British were very clever about it. He should have been prime minister, but they decided you know, for their own purposes, that he shouldn't be prime minister, but leader of government business. And the British come out of this thinking he's a really good guy, and this is a really smart party that compared with all the other guys who'd been political leaders before, this guy delivers the good. He's a politician. He's not just a politician, such a statesman. It is my earnest and confident belief that my people in Ghana will go forward in freedom and justice in unity among themselves. On the 6th of March 1957, Kwame Nkrumah became Ghana's first Prime Minister of an independent state. The Gold Coast now became Ghana. Ghana was the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to obtain independence. And so therefore he was an inspiration to an entire continent to arise and seek their own freedom from the shackles of colonialism. At long last, the battle has ended. Your beloved country is free forever. Freedom! Kwame Nkrumah became Ghana's first prime minister of an independent state. The Gold Coast now became Ghana. We were very, very proud, you know, because for the first time we had a Ghanaian in charge of Ghana. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing the whole of us. To symbolize that the Gold Coast was now an independent country, Kwame Nkrumah and his Convention People's Government decided to change the name from the Gold Coast to the historically ancient name of Ghana. 
ancient Ghana, um, going back as far back as the 5th century, was an ancient kingdom in West Africa and therefore Nkrumah and the CPP decided to revert back to this historic name. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah became known later as Osajefo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And Osajefo in the Akan language of Ghana means saviour. But he was also known as Showboy and uh, had another series of nicknames to indicate the extent of his charisma, which was electric. His, his slogan was, thought without action is empty, and action without thought is blind, so that we need men and women who think like men and women of action and act like men and women of thought. The tax then was to begin to build a new nation, united nation, a nation in which its people saw themselves first and foremost as Ghanaians, rather than as Shantis and Airways and Dagombas and so on. So that was the tax. The primary tax was to build a new united Ghana with a distinct Ghanaian identity. The challenges that Nkrumah faces start well before independence. In 1954, the Minister of Finance, who is Kamala Bedema, stands up and presents a paper to the cabinet saying uh, the cocoa price is going to go down, that basically chocolate makers worldwide are overstocked, the price of chocolate is going to go down, there's no market growth predictable in future. And the conclusions drawn in cabinet then are what we want to do in terms of social change, advancing the need for education for all, health service, building a deep water port at Tema, uh, improving the infrastructure so that the supply of uh, farm produce to towns and so on can be enhanced and so on. We're going to have to do that fast. So they spend like uh, drunken sailors. Some of the industrialization projects he carried out were the building of roads, there was various schools and hospitals. He poured a great deal of money into education. In a relatively short period of about six years, educational institutions had been built in all the districts of Ghana that introduced fee-free and compulsory education for every Ghanaian child. For all students, both girls and boys, from primary school to higher education. They're using up reserves because it's not going to last. They know that the, there are bad times coming. So that is the fundamental challenge, that if you want to reconstruct a state, if you want to make a modern state, if you want to industrialize a state, and so on, you need cash. There's no serious outside investment at the time. There's a lot of bent outside investment at the time, which is another story. But he, he, the challenge he faces basically is a decline in government revenue. And it's fundamentally a government revenue-based development project that, that he's on about with the first two five-year plans. The construction of the hydroelectric project in Akosombo was key to the industrialization of Ghana. With declining state revenues, with an increasingly hostile Western world, but I think also an indifferent Eastern world, Russia does always talk about supporting him, but in terms of what actually turns up on the doorstep in terms of cash or things, not very much to show for it. He has gone to the US to raise funds for the construction of the Akosombo Dam. The US didn't want to support, and they were dragging their feet. So he reluctantly had to make a move to the Soviet Union to support. And that was when, when America decided that it's, you know, Kaiser. You have to remember, in the world, there was sort of East versus the West. We were involved in what they called the Cold War, you know, communism versus capitalism. Africa was caught in the middle. All the countries that had become liberated and were fighting for their freedom were vying for that country to be in either the Western camp or the Eastern camp. Kwame Nkrumah and the parliament decided that there must be non 